Hi, I'm Matt, and welcome to CData Arc. This is a long video covering many different data mapping techniques in Arc, so I've listed the topics and the timestamps for you to jump around as necessary. I'll begin with the three topics necessary for every mapping, templates, for each loops, and value mappings, then I'll move into the more advanced techniques. So let's get started. Every data mapping flow starts with converting your existing data, like files, database tables, and application objects, into an XML representation, called a template. Once all of your data is XML, you can then map one XML template onto the other using the XML map connector. Templates are generated by dedicated connectors depending on what format your data is currently in. So if you're using a database connector or an application connector like Salesforce, these connectors automatically generate XML templates for whatever tables or data objects you need. Files, on the other hand, are converted into templates using the upload test file feature of a file-based connector. This option is found in the input tab under the more dropdown for connectors like CSV, X12, Edifact, and so on. The XML map connector reads templates from adjacent connectors in the flow, and you can use the source file and the destination file dropdowns to ensure that the right templates are being used. Mappings need to handle repeated structures, so the first thing to figure out is what structures can be repeated within your data. For example, orders may have multiple line items, shipping notices may have multiple packages, and healthcare documents may have multiple insurance claims. Figure out which element in your source and destination represent these repeated structures. For example, in an 850 purchase order, a TX401850 element represents an order, and then further down, a PO1 loop 1 segment represents line items within that order. In our database, our orders table handles orders, and our order items table handles line items. So, I can drag the TX element onto my orders table to create a for each order mapping, and then within that, I can drag the PO1 loop 1 onto the order items table to create a for each line item mapping. Once you have your for each loops figured out for repeated structures, you can then move on to mapping individual values within those structures. Value mappings are simple once you have your for each loops established. We just need to ensure that each value from our source ends up in the right element in our destination. For example, the BEG03 element here in our source data is the purchase order number. So I just need to drag that onto the purchase order number column in our database to ensure that that value ends up where it should be. I could continue mapping more values here, but since basic value mappings are so simple, let's go ahead and move on to more complicated mapping operations. Lookaheads are used to differentiate between multiple copies of the same structure in your data. As an example, an EDI document might reference multiple parties, like a build to party, a ship to party, a remit to party, and so on. In an X12850, the details of each party are held in an in one loop one structure, but it's not immediately obvious which in one loop one corresponds to which party in the exchange. So if we're looking to map our customer address data, we need to know which of these in one loop ones contains the ship to party. We need to find an identifier value within these in one loop ones that clarify which party it describes. I happen to know that the in one in 101 element contains this identifier, so we can solve this problem with a look ahead that targets this element. To create the look ahead, we start with a basic value mapping. In this case, the address information is contained in in3 in301, so let's go ahead and map that value. Now, we want to add look ahead logic, and to do that, I'll go into the expression editor using this tablet and pencil icon. We want to look inside this in one loop one segment, so I'll start the look ahead there with this special square bracket syntax. Inside the square brackets, I specify the X path to the identifier I want to check, which as I just mentioned is the in one in 101 element in this case. When the value at that path is ST, I know I'm dealing with the ship to party, so I'll use this equals syntax. And that's all that we need for this look ahead. The expression now reads, grab the address from in 301 but only when in 101 equals ST, because that's the ship to party. Some mappings require conditional logic that's more general than the lookaheads that we just discussed. For this, we can add a condition within the mapping, like this. Any elements inside this condition will only appear if the condition is true. To set the condition, I can click here, and then go to add a new rule. These rules check a certain value in the input document against a logical comparison that I configure here. As a simple example, let's say that this currency code should only show up if it's not USD for US dollars, because USD is the implied default. I can check the input element that contains my currency code, then set not equals as the operator, and then finally USD as the value to compare against. 
With this condition set, only non-USD values will appear in my output, so my conditional is done. But another way that you can use conditionals is by having multiple different conditions with the same output element within each one, like this. This essentially creates if-else logic, where that output element's value depends on which of these conditions is true. Sometimes we need to remove levels of hierarchy in our data as we map it. Take the following XML as a simple example. The data, in the data element, is within a container element that is superfluous. And maybe we want to generate XML where the data elements are siblings of each other, kind of like this. This requires removing one level of hierarchy, namely that container element layer, and we do that with loop nodes. In the XML map connector, you can right-click to create a new node, like a new loop node. These loop nodes function like for each mapping nodes, except that they don't actually appear in the output. This has the effect of removing the element that is mapped to it from the output, while preserving any children of that element. In this case, let's go ahead and map container from our source onto this loop node. This generates the usual for each syntax, so we can access the data within each container in our source. Now to map the data, we would perform the normal value mapping between the source and the destination. OK, so now let's save and run a test file to verify this works. In the input tab, I'll upload a test file that has the original containerized structure and send it through this mapping. So here, let's look at the input XML with that extra layer of hierarchy that is the container. And then we'll head back into ARC and find the output file in the output tab so that we can verify that this layer of hierarchy is removed by using these loop nodes instead of a typical for each mapping. And here we can see that the data elements are now siblings without that extra container layer of hierarchy. While ARC is broadly a no-code integration platform, it does also support scripting for maximum extensibility. ArcScript is an XML-based language that may look different from other scripting languages you've encountered, so I do recommend starting by checking out our ArcScript quick start in the knowledge base at arc.cdata.com. Once you know how to use ArcScript, there are two ways to use scripting in the XML map connector. One, output nodes can have scripts that return values, or two, script nodes can be added that do not return values. I'll walk through an example of each. For an example of a script that returns output, let's imagine that we're mapping an item name for a purchase order, but we only have the item code available in our source. We want to output the name based on the code using a script. First, I'll click on the XML tag icon, which is the script editor, for my desired output node. And now I can start scripting. First, we want to read the item code from the input and set it to a variable. So I'm using an arc set statement here, and then I'll use the xpath function within square brackets to read the item code from my input document at the xpath that I specified. OK, so once my item code is stored as a variable here, I can write a select case statement to check for each of my known item codes. So I'll use arc select, and then my value that I'm selecting against is the variable that I just defined. OK, now I need a case statement for each possible code within the select statement. And then let's say the first possible code is A5. And now let's say that the A5 item code just represents a fork. So inside my case statement, I'll add an arc set statement to set a new variable to the item name, which in this case would be fork. OK, we can close up that case. And now let's add one more case statement here to make the point clear. Let's say that the next possible item code that we're checking for is A6. And then inside that case, let's say this is the code for a spoon. So we again want to use arc set to set our output variable to spoon. All right, so then we can close up this case and then close up the select. And now it's time to output our item name. This bottom line of the script determines the output from our script. So within this tag, I'll just reference the output variable that we set earlier in square brackets like this. And now with this script, we'll convert from the item code to the item name as we're mapping the value. Next, let's do an example of a script node, which does not return output. To understand why that's valuable, let's consider the following mapping case. We're mapping an outbound EDI invoice, and we need to count how many line items there are in our invoice. However, the element in the EDI document that we store the line item count is outside of the for each loop that we've established for our line items. So we need to count the number of loops, and then save that value via a script node, and then return it later down here in the CTT segment. To do that, I'll add a new script node to the output here within the for each loop for line items. Then I can open the script and use an arc set statement to set a variable using a special item in arc script called underscore map. 
This is an item that persists throughout the mapping, so if I save a variable to it here, I can reference that variable in later segments. Okay, so I'll write the line of code here and then explain it. All right. So this set statement starts by reading the current value of underscore map dot line count. And if that doesn't exist yet, it defaults it def to zero. Then it increments it by one. So since this script is inside the for each loop, it'll execute every loop. And thus incrementing underscore map dot line count will count the number of loops and store it. All right, now I can save this script and return to the mapping and head down to the CTT segment where that line item count is required in my outbound EDI invoice. I'll open up the CTT01 element and then simply reference the variable name in square brackets to return the line count that was calculated earlier. And now with this mapping setup, I can count the line items, store that value using a script node and the underscore map item, and then use that value later where it belongs. So that covers a range of different mapping techniques within ARC and the XML map connector. Hopefully this helps with your own mapping projects. Thanks for watching, and as always, you can find more resources at arc.cdata.com.